Welcome to the Believe in OK State podcast. Along with Nathan Gilslider, I'm Justin Southwell. Nate, we made it. We are through the non-conference, and it's time to show out against the conference opponents. I'll be at a new one in Utah. Been waiting for this one. Been waiting for this one. This is uh, this is exciting. This is exciting. Utah is led by head coach Kyle Whittingham, who went to BYU. Interesting. This is his third conference with Utah, stepping up from the Mountain West to the Pac-12 in 2011, and rising again from the Pac-12 to the Big 12 in 2024. He has a record of 165 and 79 in his 20th season as the head coach of the Utes. His coaching experience at Utah dates back to another 11 years as assistant coach and defensive coordinator. He has an 11 and six bowl record, which ranks fourth among active head coaches. They have lost their last five bowl games, but he does have two PAC 12 championships, 2021 and 2022 and one mountain West championship in 2008. He has one unclaimed national championship from that 2008 season Following a win over number four Alabama and Boise State's loss, the Utes ended their season 13 0 as the nation's only undefeated team. And in the final post AP poll, they were ranked number two with 16 first place votes behind number one Florida's 48. Compared to Mike Gundy, Gundy has a 12 and 6 bowl record and overall record of 169 and 79. Also in his 20th season as the head coach of the Cowboys. Still, just that one conference championship in 2011. One other thing to consider with Gundy is his record in conference openers. He's sitting at 10 and 9 right now, but it might be a little more nuanced than that. If you look at the conference home openers, maybe it's a bit more favorable. Gundy is 14 and five in conference home openers with the last loss being in 2018 to the Allen Bowman led Texas Tech Red Raiders. While there are some struggles with the run game right now and some lingering issues with explosive plays on defense, it seems like the Cowboys are ahead of where they typically are at this point in the year. We're averaging 42.6 points per game on offense and surrendering an average of 20.3 points per game on defense against a pretty tough non-conference slate. So Nate, before we kind of dive into a little bit more of what Utah looks like, what's your confidence level heading into this matchup, uh, knowing that based off of our non-conference slate compared to Utah's, which appears to be quite a bit weaker. Do you think that that bodes well for the Cowboys that they've been battle tested up to this point? Well, that's what I've been telling myself for a while is that it would be worth it. You know, when you play games like these that we have in the past several weeks, you find out a lot about yourself. And so what I'm hoping is that the coaching staff is able to take away a lot from these three weeks and figure out at a, quicker than what we normally do about who we are as a team. You know, one of the staples of Coach Gundy's teams is is that early on, early on it's usually not not hitting out of the gates unless it's one of the, you know, one of our really, really good teams, which I think this can still be. But he usually finds out who you are as a team and then takes off and you see large improvements, you know, and I, I think that's what we're going to start seeing. This is the time where you start seeing that, right? Three, four weeks into the season, we say, okay, hey, we're scrapping this. We're doing this. This is what we're good at. This is what we're not good at. doesn't matter what you were good at last year. doesn't matter what you were good at two years ago. This is what we're good at right now. We're going to get simplified, and then we're going to get really good at that and then maybe add on to it. So that's a staple of, of Coach Gundy's team. So I really do think um, we gain a lot of it, gain a lot of um, – in-season experience for the for the games that we've played um especially especially i should say the arkansas game that was a, that was the first real adversity we faced in the season and we saw how we responded 
I believe that we're going to see a lot of adversity in this game. They're going to punch back. You know, we're going to we're going to give up some plays. Hopefully, we're going to make some plays. So, I know that this Oklahoma State team doesn't give up. This this Oklahoma State team fights. This Oklahoma State team uses their experience and knows how to close ball games. So that gives me a lot of hope because we've already seen that. And that's what you're hoping for when you get battle tested early on. This Utah team has not been battle tested this year. They've actually done quite a few things that are maybe a little bit uncharacteristic from Kyle Whittingham teams. Their run defense, while always stout, hasn't been quite as good as it usually is. Their DBs gave up quite a few big plays um, in their last game against the Utah State. Unfortunately, the last couple of years, Cam Rising has been often injured, and when he gets injured, the team just quite frankly doesn't function the same. We are expecting him to play, but we don't know at what capacity. You know, we've heard a lot about the injury to his throwing finger, I believe, one of the fingers on his throwing hand. Don't know exactly what the extent of that. And I've even heard, you know, unfortunately, he's had quite a few knee injuries in the past, that there's some lingering things going on with his knees. So you just don't know what you're going to get. But what you do know is that when Cam Rising's out there, they're a better football team, and we expect them to play. So I'm expecting, you know, full throttle, Utah Utes, physical battle, and I'm excited for it. This is this is fantastic. You know, fortunately and unfortunately for Oklahoma State, these next three weeks is going to dictate a lot about what what we have in front of us and if we're able to achieve the goals that they've set out. So, hey, this is what you train nine months for to play for three three months, right? This is the game that the coaches have worked on in the offseason, did the extra little bit of scouting. So game on. I am excited, and I fully expect BPS to show out, and uh, I am I am really ready for this one. Yeah, speaking of putting forth effort over the past nine months, you really have to consider all the talent leading up to that point. I was looking at the composite recruiting rankings between these two teams over the past four years, according to 24 seven sports in 2024, Utah ranked 59th overall 2023 was 20th overall 2022 34th overall and 2021 35th overall. If you compare that to Oklahoma State, those same years, 24 through 21, 56th, 55th, 29th, and 31st, the average on both of those comes out to 37th for Utah, 42nd for Oklahoma State. No surprise there, right? I mean, that the similarities, right? right? I mean, it's, it's really as impressive, eerily similar, but this just goes to show, just to your point, hey, this is going to be an even matchup. Talent's going to be very similar on both sides. I love it. This is this is tons of really parallels neat. between That's the right. two programs. Their returning production, of course. I think we've got to start with their most valuable player, quarterback number seven, Cam Rising. Rising supposedly makes all the difference in the world for Utah's offense. He has been in the same system for so long that he's clearly got a mastery understanding of their playbook. You know, you mentioned it already, but it really is going to be the story of the game. Will his throwing hand injury impact his performance against really an unfamiliar opponent in Oklahoma State? We've seen what he can do against the teams that he's familiar with in the Pac-12. But whenever you're playing a brand new opponent in a hostile environment, you know, Nate, do you kind of subscribe to the notion that this game ultimately comes down to if Cam Rising is healthy enough? in in some sorts yes i do i think with just in the obviously not being in the same conference you know i've only been able to watch them a handful of times over the years but they look drastically different when he is healthy you know he does just enough with his legs to keep people honest he's tough he's gritty he's a veteran he committed to OU when Bob Stoops was still coaching. I mean, he, you know, he's just like, you know, he's like our Bowman, right? He is the the driver of this team. And how close this game is, is going to depend on his health and his, you know, if he's playing, how long he plays, if he's able to stay in. It just changes so much for them. And uh, it is a major factor for me in what this game is going to look like for Utah. One thing to note. OSU's passing defense has 
not been great. We're giving up 7.6 yards per pass. Total defense has statistically been bad. We're giving up 462 yards per game. But of course, points matter most, right? They're they're doing that bend but don't break thing. And I think it absolutely helps that we're playing in Boone Pickens Stadium. Yeah. And whenever it comes down to teams like this that are so similar, everything coming down to essentially that discipline and toughness, the culture, things like that. One of those things that I think really stands out on the field, obviously it's the penalties and penalty yardage, the the heading yardage that goes into that. But I think it's going to come down to how each team performs in the red zone specifically. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be able to score points, be it a field goal or a touchdown, I really do believe that Nardo's defense, while the numbers look abysmal, it seems like they do really well whenever they're faced with a red zone defense situation backs against the wall and they don't break. I feel like that's going to be really a key matchup and it it doesn't really matter what they've done in the past. It doesn't matter what Oklahoma state has done in the past, but I think that that could be a big point in this game. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I think it's a little bit early in the year to start talking about, you know, like what defenses or offenses have done from a statistical standpoint on average and thing like that. I mean, as you can imagine, that Arkansas game is going to carry a lot of weight for a lot of this season. So regardless of how they do and how they perform, right? I mean, they performed very well against TU and the numbers still look atrocious. They're going to look that way for a while because of how abysmal that performance was for two and a half quarters. Um, to their credit, like we talked about, you know, they made the changes and really locked it up um, in the fourth and in overtime. The thing that scares me the most about Utah when they get in the red zone specifically is their abundance of tight ends that are very large and very athletic. I think it's going to come down to Kendall Daniels and Trey Rucker being able to guard them in man coverage, which we are going to do. That's what Oklahoma State does. We love to challenge with man coverage, and that's what those guys are supposed to be there for. That's why we that's why we recruit the long, rangy um, defenders is to be able to do that. We know that Kendall Daniels in the past has had some issues with getting his eyes violated from tight ends on play action. That cannot happen in this game, right? I mean, that's a huge, especially in in tight. So Utah is going to throw their tight ends. They're going to run with their tight ends. It is incumbent upon us to make sure that we read our keys and stay with them. Otherwise, they're going to get behind us quickly. I think what their one of their tight ends is a Former basketball player, he's got two catches for two touchdowns. He's six foot seven. He jumps, you know, he can actually really leap, you know. So it's it's going to be a, it's going to be an issue, no doubt about it. But like you said, we do we do a, we have done a much better job, and even as even even into last season in the red zone. And so I think that is a strength of this team, really, because we said we are a very rangy, athletic team and so when you can compress the field we can cover a lot and I think that's to our benefit as you saw in the Arkansas game when they got in the red zone and our defensive line was struggling so much they ran right through us in the first half I'm hoping that we've made those adjustments so we'll see how Utah um, when they get in that area how they like to do things but it is it is for sure going to be a challenge with their personnel no doubt about it yeah you mentioned that tight end I think on one of those touchdown passes he lined up as an outside receiver. Yeah. And that's where that versatility, just being an athlete, right? Playing basketball at Baylor, you're probably a pretty darn good athlete. So, so you know, Utah, I, I heard um, from, I can't, I think it was on the radio from a Utah person that was, fill, was calling in. I believe they even have a 41 personnel package where they've got their four tight ends on the field. <laughs> so as you can imagine, they're going to line them up everywhere. They're, they're very versatile. They've put several in the NFL. Um, this is something that we haven't seen a lot of in this conference. Some teams use tight ends, some don't. We're starting to use our tight end again. It's kind of cyclical, but this is something that Utah has done for quite a while. They're going to keep doing it, and we're going to have to be able to defend it. Yeah, some of these other guys we might need to watch out for. Veteran running back number two, Micah Bernard. This season he has 274 yards and one touchdown, 41 attempts. He has 1,482 rushing yards and eight touchdowns in his career. In my opinion, he's the guy who carried Utah in the past couple of games whenever Cam Rising went down with that hand injury. 
He stepped up big time whenever they needed to to win on the road at Utah State. I mean, how do you feel like Nick Martin's going to be able to fare against a running back like this guy who's just – it sounds like all about that discipline and toughness. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they really have gone uh, running back com- by committee this year so far. He does seem to be probably, if you were to label it, their, their RB1. But they've got three guys that they really have gotten quite a few carries in this year. But to your point, one thing one thing that is a staple of Utah, and it has been really ever since Coach Whittingham was there, is they are very physical at the point of attack on both lines. And so this is this is going to be a – you know, a, a D line, can you eat it up and allow Nick Martin to fire through when he sees a shot? If not, it's going to look a lot like it has. Well, I shouldn't say that because the TU game was really good, but it's going to look a lot. To probably like what it was against Arkansas. Exactly. That's exactly maybe, right. Maybe not as big so, and girthy as the offensive line. That no, we saw they're against. not, but they're not, but they are just as, if physical. not more physical at the point of attack. And so, you know, it's going to hopefully. You know, I thought in the TU game we were a lot better about flowing and not overflowing like we did in the Arkansas game. So this is this is you know this is where you want to see those improvements, and this is going to be one of those games, like you said. You know, Nick Martin is going to be crucial as always for us, and I think Trey Rucker again. You know, he's gonna he's gonna be at the point of attack, and if we can make those tackles or not, it's going to be crucial to how much we can slow down that running attack. Another guy that I've got on my radar, wide receiver number 10, Money Parks. And he's a senior who has caught at least one pass in 28 straight games. This season he has eight receptions, 133 yards, and two touchdowns. So we'll see how Corey Black can lock him down, I guess. I wanted to talk about the newcomer, wide receiver number three, Dorian Singer, who transferred from USC. Yeah, He's that deep threat who can really stretch the field. And so far this season, he's got 10 receptions for 109 yards, zero touchdowns, but he did have a long catch against Utah State for 25. Yeah, I think it's a really solid unit. It's not going to be one that you're like, oh my gosh, there's that guy. But they're all very good athletes. You know, you add in a guy like Singer, who's electric. Um, You know, he hasn't really popped this season, but you know it's there. You saw it at USC. Um, So... This is this is going to be a challenge. We're going to play a lot of man, like I said earlier. So is it going to be closer to what we saw at TU, or is it going to be like Arkansas where they were running free for days? I sure hope not. But <laughs> this is going to be a challenge. Like you said, Corey Black um, we've, and Cam Smith just got, came off a great game. Um, so I, we've seen some strides there. So hopefully we'll continue to see that and um, they can shut this down. And Colby Hilson has that momentum from last year. He really, or, yeah. From last game as well. Yeah, right. That was really his first full game of action, right? They've kind of been easing him back. And he definitely made some plays. I know TU is not a great team. So I hope, you know, people that listen to this are not, or just taken away from our last, what we were able to see last. And what we did see last was an improvement. So it's a good game of confidence, though, and going yeah. into conference play. So it's a. Uh, can't dismiss it completely, but again, you know, kind of take some of this with a grain of salt for sure. Absolutely. On defense, they do return a lot from a group that ranked in the top 20 nationally in total defense, scoring defense, rushing defense, and sacks. But they lost a playmaking difference maker and all American defensive end edge. Jonah Ellis, who is now with the Denver Broncos. One of their key contributors is senior corner number five, Zamaya Vaughn. He has played in 48 career games at 28 starts. Last year, he earned all Pac-12. And potentially a rising star on the roster, sophomore corner number two, Smith Snowden. Uh, He ranked as the number four recruit in the state of Utah and the number 30 defensive back in the country, according to 24 seven sports, he had an interception against Utah state in that last game. You know, this is their calling card. Their coach in waiting is their defensive coordinator. You know, he and coach Whittingham are tied at the hip and they have been so good at this for so long. And coach Gunny made a remark about this. And this is one of the things that I'm really intrigued about, about this matchup and really about, 
kind of the, some of the early season struggles we've seen from Oklahoma State and what people have done against us. In the, what they normally play, they normally play with just one high safety, and they ha- usually have the other safety mid to down. So that alone always has them with an extra or at least a half man in the box extra. So this is one of the contributing factors to why Utah has been amazing run defense for several years now. This is kind of what they do. They shut down the run, make you one-dimensional. This is a big reason why. So Oklahoma State's been seeing stack boxes for the last three weeks. Now, does Utah go ahead and add an extra half man to a man and do what Tulsa and Arkansas did? Do they say, hey, this is our bread and butter. We're going to make you prove that you can run on us. You know what I mean? So here's a little bit of the cat and mouse game that we're going to see because they're they're for sure going to start out at the very least at the one high, you know, hey, this is what we do. This is what Utah f- football is. This is what we run. Beat it. And so we're either going to have to force it. So either they're going to, you know, they're going to bring another half down and make Alan Bowman beat him, make some tight window throws, or they're going to make Ollie Gordon do his thing and the offensive line finally click together and get to that second level and at least give him an opportunity to gash a few. So this is really intriguing to me. Um, and I think this is the matchup part of it that we saw coming into it from the off season. What would we see? Would it be Ollie Gordon running wild on a defense that normally doesn't allow that to happen? I don't know, but I do know that the last three games that we've seen is people said, make Alan Bowman beat us. He has. Now, will Utah do the same? I don't know. I think they probably will. At the very least, I think they're going to say, Ollie, make us go back, and we'll see what happens. Well, one thing to be encouraged by, I think, is Utah State was seemingly able to throw it deep against Utah's defense. Going into the season, that was a concern for me. I think playing against a tough team like Arkansas and seeing it especially against Tulsa when they just refused to do anything other than try to stop Ollie Gordon in the run game. Alan Bowman up and he has made big time throws. I'll continue to defend him to say that his deep ball looks much better than it did it, last season. It, cer- it certainly does. Yeah. And it I even, think that yeah. I, I, I didn't have the confidence in him necessarily going into the year to think that if it's going to be put on his shoulders to win the game, to make these type of throws, I would say I'm not so sure. After the Bedlam game last year, when that's what OU said, this is what you're going to have to do to beat us. And he did. You know, that was the first time for me when I really saw the old Alan Bowman that we saw at Texas Tech. I've seen similar to that. Um, I saw a stat to where I think last year he was in the top 20 in fastest releases from snap to release. This year, he's number eighth nationally. So he's cut that down even more so. So he's being very decisive. He's given, he's taking what they're giving him and he's making the play. So I think, again, this is something that people are going to have. They're, Utah's going to make them see that at least early on. And I know you and I have kind of been a little bit critical of him, some of his early deep shot misses in the game. You can't miss that against Utah early in the game because if you want Alan, Bo- you want Alan Bowman to do this, to, to let Ollie Gordon get out and get open, you have to hit him early and you have to show and you have to back them off. Otherwise, they're just going to keep making you do it. And so for me, I, I've been kind of hypercritical of some of the early misses. And this is why, because you get in these games, you don't get very many opportunities. Utah, historically, I know we saw that against Utah State. They were able to get behind them. But they've got coaches, too, and they're going to make some changes. And that, and to be quite frank, a couple of those catches that Utah State made were insane. Those guys were – <laughs> uh, those those were big boy catches. Not that our guys yeah, can't make them. But sure. um, I, I just – I believe that they're still, at least early on, going to make Alan Bowman show them. And whether that's the first possession – I mean, this is against Arkansas. We missed our deep shot. Against TU, we missed our first deep shot. Against – uh SDSU we missed our first deep shot you know what I mean so we have to hit on this and I I think we saw this last week with some of the wide receivers really coming into their own especially Stribling you know he was off a whole year with a hand injury he looked so much more comfortable last week and when he got one-on-one going back and catching the ball out front and and going so uh, I'm I'm excited for this I think to your point I think Bowman's going to have to be able to prove it I did not realize that stat that he was number eight in the country with his release. I think that 
maybe, maybe that's contributing to zero sex. Absolutely. Not necessarily that we're giving up a, not, I'm not trying to take credit away from our offensive line, but people were kind of wondering how is it that the pass blocking is so good with giving up zero sacks versus the run blocking where it seems like we're not able to get any kind of a push. Ollie can't find any holes. It could be in part just because Alan Bowman has a very quick release. Well, he does. And if, even if you'll notice, um, he's, he's, he has been so anticipatory this year. It was almost to a fault in the Arkansas game. Like he was anticipating too much. And some of the guys were getting caught up in traffic and they weren't, you know, everything was off. Right. Yeah. In, in the TU game, he was on point when, you know, one of my favorite sayings as a wide receiver and, and you'll, you know, all coaches will say it is if you're even, you're leaving. That means, you know, if, the, if you're a wide receiver and you're in one-on-one coverage and you get even with that DB, he's going to throw it because you're going to beat him because the DB has to turn and run and you're automatically going to be out in front. And so Bowman does a fantastic job of recognizing that off the snap. And so he's anticipating and he throws it before they are open and they're running open and getting to that space. And I think that's where you saw that catch and run against TU because he was able to put it on them in stride. So to your point, he's even when he, we do throw deep, he's getting rid of it so early. You know, there was some talk about that interception in the Arkansas game. He threw that before the DB even stacked our wide receiver out of trust. And that's what you, you know, he's a veteran player with veteran wide receivers. He's going to trust that they're going to beat him and they're going to get on top. So you're going to continue to see that. And that's one of the reasons that you're seeing even, yes, we are throwing deep, but it's coming out really quickly and it is helping our pass pro. There's no doubt about it. If you're even, you're leaving. That sounds like Des Bryant. All day, Boom. every day. <laughs> just, he was so good at getting on top. That's it. That's it. Once you're even, once you are even use the hand, hit the hip, <laughs> dip inside, it's gone, baby. JB so, did the same okay. thing. Yep. Well, let's dive into some uniform predictions. I saw that Utah decided they're going to wear all white, and I don't blame them based on the forecast. Yeah. Uh, so today I put out this tweet breaking down OSU's conference home opener jersey color and the win-loss result. They're 9-0 and when wearing black jerseys, 0-2 when wearing orange. I feel like there's too much on the line. You got to <laughs> suck it up. If it's too hot, you just have to wear black. You have to go, I think, black, black, orange versus Cowboys. Give me that Bedlam combo. Oh. It's our big game combo. <laughs> Biggest game on the schedule this year. I feel like you've got to uh, wear it. Hey, realistically you know, though, I think they might go all orange just because it's going to be so hot. That would be pretty sick. It's funny though. I actually went black, black, orange with Patriot Pete because I was <laughs> okay. I was thinking the same thing. I was like, I love it. The people love it. It looks so good on TV. They're going to go all white. We're going to give them the colors. Uh, I was I was in for it. Um, but again, I know that they, I know that they do. Whether people actually want to admit this or not, you know, you and I know for a fact that they do take weather into account when they are picking early season uniforms. Yes. For sure. um, and obviously the Utah is wearing all white is confirmed. Yes. But we've had Justin Williams on the pod before and brought up the point that they wore white at home versus West Virginia in 2020, the ring of honor game. And we're like, white. we want to see white at home more often. And he was like, if I, as long as I'm the equipment manager here, will never wear white at home again. He hates it. So uh, it does, it does break all the rules. It does break all the rules. It does. Yeah. I think um, you know LSU gets away with it. The Dallas Cowboys get away with it, and you know that's about it. Every once in yeah. a while, you might see some other teams in the NFL doing it. Miami Dolphins are kind of notorious for it at this point. It gets so yeah. hot in Miami that they're they're going to bust out the whites and make the other team, quote unquote, suffer in, in the heat down there. So that's right. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's jump over to some score predictions. Bet online has the spread at Oklahoma State plus two at the time we're recording. The over under is set at fifty four points, implying a score of twenty eight to twenty six. 
in favor of Utah winning. So, Nathan, with that information, what uh, what's your score prediction and how do you see this game playing out? Yeah, so I, I got a few stats here because this is – this is something that I, I love. Um, you know, a lot of the analytics, like to your to your point, a lot of the analytics, even though Vegas says two point, all the advanced stats basically say this is less than a one point advantage one way or the other. So in our last 10 home games as a true underdog, Coach Gundy is nine and one. We've won seven in a row against top 25 opponents at home. That includes wins against Texas, OU, Kansas State, Iowa State, um, and Kansas last year. Nice. It is going to be hot. It is going to be humid. This I think I saw today in Utah, it was 70 degrees in Salt Lake. Their strength of schedule is 113th, so we do not know much about what they are and what they are going to be outside of what they have been for the last 20 years under Coach Whittingham and with cam rising i think penalties special teams and turnovers the hidden yardage is going to make this game it is going to be who makes that turnover late who doesn't the stupid penalty that calls back a touchdown you know the uh the punt return or the guy that doesn't take that doesn't get it and lets it bounces and goes another 20 yards you know those are little things that people don't see and these this is why these two teams have had the success that they've had They've both been extremely good at this. And this is why they've been able to overcome some of the talent gap. So with all that being said, with where we're at as a team, I'm going to go 34-30 Oklahoma State in a tight one. I do believe we will get Ollie going in some capacity in this game. We've held back just a touch on what we're doing. And I think there's been a lot of us trying to do some things that maybe we're not great at, trying to get better at it. Those are going to be out this game. When you go into a season, usually in the summer, you pick three or four games that you have staff scout and watch teams and get extra info on. This is one of those games that they did that with. So I do not believe this is going to be a game where we get out schemed on either side of the ball. Now, what does that mean? How, you know, what kind of um, adjustments do we make? I'm sure Utah did a lot of the same things. You know, they're looking at this hey, how are we going to win our new conference? I know Oklahoma State was one, going to be one of those teams. But Coach Gundy, historically, in this in this time and in these situations, does not get out schemed. But, you know, I think a lot back to those Texas games when we had that winning streak going against Texas. And quite honestly, we had no business just racking them up like we did if you're looking at it from a talent perspective. But that was execution and penalties, special teams, and turnovers. And our schemes, we knew what we wanted to do. So I've got 34-30 OSU which is a, it's going to be a massive one if we're wanting to win the Big 12 considering who we play next week. You know, I love stats. So everything that you just said is great. <laughs> I don't know how much more I could add to that. I do have Oklahoma State winning. This is the Believe in OK State podcast. I have them winning a close one, 31-28. Mm. I could also see this one being 53-51 because it I mean, goes into triple overtime. <laughs> and it's so evenly matched that we see you know, who's able to get that. It's that a crime. This is not a night game, by the way. I just want to throw that out there. It's a, it's a crime. Big big noon kickoff. You're at it Ohio is. State Marshall. Like, what are we doing here? Unbelievable. Um, now Oklahoma State has a record of 25-3 and three in Boone Pickens Stadium dating back to 2020. Home field advantage should be in full force in another sold-out game. You mentioned the weather. We've already mentioned uh, you know, the toughness, both programs. Coach Glass, another hidden advantage, perhaps. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, I've got them. I've got Oklahoma State winning, and that's all that matters. Just got to get that. Just got to get the win at the end of the day. We'll go on from there. Yeah. Yep. This is exciting, man. This is you know one of the things when you're looking at the Big Twelve and what it could be even if it's just for a few short years, because we don't know what's going to happen. But this is what makes it fun. There's a probably five teams right now that really anybody, you know, you've got Kansas State, Oklahoma State, Utah, Iowa State, UCF, I think are, it, are really right there. And it starts now. And for Oklahoma State, it starts right now. 
if you can find a way over the next three weeks to either go two and one or three and oh, and then get, you know, we have two buys on the back end and maybe get Colin Oliver back, get some guys healthy. You know, one of the things I, I over the last several years with Oklahoma State, we've kind of gotten screwed with our bye weeks. We've had these early bye weeks and then we've That's had true. these seven, eight game stretches down the way. And, you know, one thing for Oklahoma State is, and, and when, especially when we were playing OU the last game of the year, their depth always showed up. And that's what OU does, right? In Texas, you have all these guys, all these athletes. Now, you know, we've played with them, we've beat them, we've done all these things. But when you continue to have them in late in the year, that's going to be a bigger factor. So for me, I do find some solace in the fact that these are early. So if you can get these early, we know that Mike Gundy's teams almost always, honestly, there's only one year I can think of in the last 20 where his team has gotten worse. And there was so much internal turmoil that was really the major factor, but they are going to continue to get better. So if you can get past this, we know this is not the best version of what this team is going to be, but they can be very, very good. And if you look at, if you compare the last two years and you say, are, is this team as good as last year's team? Well, right now, as good as when this team finished, I'd probably say not yet, especially when you're talking about offensive line play. But if you were to say after game three last year compared to game three this year, it's not even close. And so we know that they're going to continue to get better. So this is huge for Oklahoma State, huge for our chances of big t- making the Big 12 title game, college football playoffs. We have to have one of the next two. There's like There's no way around that. You have to have one of the next two in order to make that happen. And at home in a hot Boone Pickens stadium is no better time. I'll say the caveat as far as the comparison between last year's first three games and this year's first three games, offense is absolutely better. hundred <laughs> percent. Having, game is, having the yes. consistency. Yeah. I'm hundred percent. The defense statistically, it's about the same. And Ooh. if you're looking at the scores, they're exactly the same. If you look at the average of the first three games from last season versus the average of the first three games, points per game this season, 20.3 for both. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you're exactly right. But it is um, it is that we're playing. It's Ollie right Gordon season. He doesn't play until the fourth week anyways. <laughs> Time to flip we're, the switch, baby. We're, we're in Ollie Gordon season. I want to see some. I want to see some stretch passes. I want to see some tosses. I want to see. I want to see some. I want to see some. Some guard. You know, H counters. I want to see some. Some helmets popping off. I want to see some paint flying. Let's go, baby. This is conference play. Let's get at it. Time to get. It. Time to get it. Yeah, baby. Well, game four versus the Utah Utes will be Saturday, September twenty first at three p.m. Central Time in Boone Pickens Stadium. It's Educators Weekend, so we're all set to educate these Utes about Oklahoma State football. Brandon Whedon will be recognized in the Hall of Honor, wear orange and be loud. And if you're unable to see them in person, the game will be televised on Fox. This episode of the Believe in OK State podcast is presented by Bet Online. Please like, share, and subscribe to show your support. We'll see you next time. And remember, all things are possible for the one who believes. 